recording, and then mm -hmm. you push and it stops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Today is the 28th of February in the year 2006. I'm Don Ahrens, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans Historic Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in these conflicts. I'm here today in the Indian well, Wells home of Frederick W. Hill. First Lieutenant Frederick W. Hill was a B-17 pilot in the U.S. Army Air Force from 1942 to 1945. He flew 32 missions in the Italian and European theaters as a Canadian in the 8th Air Force. So we're going to talk to him and about a lot of this and a lot of other things. Thank you for sharing your history with us and would you please spell your full name and tell us when and where you were born. Stop it. Hi, my name is F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K-W-H-I-L-L, -L, born in Regina, R-E-G-I-N-A, Saskatchewan, the abbreviation is S-K, that's Canadian province, Canada. And where were your folks from, and what were their names? My folks were from... Uh, my mother was from Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, and uh, married in the Canadian Maritime Provinces, and uh, her name was Grace, uh, her maiden name Grace O'Connor. And uh, my father was uh, from Southern Ontario, Walter H. A. Hill. They were both early uh, pioneer settlers in western, in the uh, Western Canada in the Regina area around 1900. Were the grandparents from there too? No. Where were they from? Well, my fathers were in Ontario. I never knew them. Uh, my mother's uh, uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. I, I, I knew my grandmother on her side. But... What was it like with your family in Canada in your, your early years, when like you started grade school or? Yeah, I went to <clears throat> grade school in uh, Campion High School, Jesuit High School in Regina. And then I went to the um, uh, University of Saskatchewan for a BA, uh, which I managed to get with distinction in uh, 41. Uh, at that time, Canada was already in the war, but I had been turned down medically, although they, they picked me up uh, and uh, in the summer of 41, they, when I was getting my medical, I was, going, I was planning to go down to the Harvard Graduate School of Business. This, this is just like before Pearl Harbor, the summer of 41. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm interested in when you were a kid, what was it like and what do you remember from school? Were you in sports or have a favorite teacher? Oh, yeah, I had some good teachers. I, I wasn't a, any super uh, athlete, but I, I participated in most of the most sports, hockey and uh, football. Uh, my sports skills were very average. What was the home like? Did, you, uh, did your father... Uh, have a business, or were you on a yeah, farm? Or? Uh, he established a business uh, in uh, Regina in 1903, which was um, two years before the province of Saskatchewan was formed, and real estate and insurance. And uh, that business is still carrying on today. It's 100, 103 years old. Um, I took over from my father when I came back after the war. Mm. And, uh, you, he, uh, there was modestly small. It wasn't a large business because it wasn't a big city. It was, those days it was, I guess, 40,000, 50,000 maybe. Mm. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had um, 
older brothers. I had one older brother, uh, 14 years older, who uh, was an electrical engineer, and um, <coughs> he was killed in a plane crash, a small private plane, in 1930. Uh, a structural defect in the wing. He was a brilliant uh, electrical engineer. He was just 24 years old. It's quite sad. And my next brother was uh, eight years older than I am, and uh, he. Um, he was in the uh, Canadian uh, Army went overseas in, uh, in 1939. He was in the reserves. Did you have a family interest in flying with the brothers? Did you get interested in that too? or? Oh, I don't know. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, my, my older brother was 14 years older than me. I was only 10 years old when he was killed. Okay. Did you have a paper route? or? Oh, yeah. I had paper routes. and. Uh, I was active with paper roads, and uh, uh, I was generally, I think I was, quit taking allowance from my parents when I was about 11 or 12. Oh, great. I, I had my own income from paper roads and other things. Did you do it by a bike, or did you get a car eventually? Or? I had a bike, and then when I got uh, old enough to get a license, I had a motorcycle for a while. Did you have one teacher that you remember that you really liked, or? Oh, I had a couple of teachers that were, as usual, they were kind of outstanding. There was a Miss McVitie in uh, grade five, yeah, who was a very outstanding teacher, and uh, the school principal at uh, grade eight was uh, uh, Mr. Heath was an excellent teacher, and I think I, I had a couple of good teachers in high school. Teachers, uh, real good teachers, are, are, are rare. I don't know. Just a, when you went to college, did you uh, were you going to be in business or an engineer? Well, or? well I was uh, probably leaning. I was always leaning towards business. I think, and uh, the, probably probably wind up in uh, family business. Um, but because um, I I was I was planning. Uh, go on to the Harvard Graduate School of Business and uh, mm -hmm. I'd been accepted to go in the fall of 41 in Boston. Back in the growing up days, did you have a favorite family meal that you enjoyed, well, that you liked more than something else? I guess our, our Sunday family roast beef and potatoes, yeah. Crazy. nice potatoes, <laughs> pretty That's standard good. fare. I had a very, my, my parents were very exceptional. I lived in a very, a very good home. I had one younger brother, two and a half years younger, Robert. Mm. He was, uh, and they, we were pretty good friends. He, he wound up in the Canadian Air Force. Mm. When were you aware of World War II, you know, what was going on in Germany, and from a Canadian standpoint, uh, what did you think about that? Well, early on, see, Canadian Canada went in the war in 39, right after it started, and my older brother Ed, the one 18 years older, he was a reserve officer and he was a captain and he went over with the uh, first contingents over to England. Of course they were in England, you know, for really for several years because of, uh, till the invasion. Uh, but Canada was very much, uh, you know, there was a, it was a volunteer uh, military then. We didn't have a, a, a draft and uh, so the young guys were going in voluntarily both into the Air Force and Army and Navy. We had not a bad little Navy I think and had corvettes on the Atlantic, sea lanes of the Atlantic and uh, so we're pretty, we're, I guess we're pretty asking, we're, we were pretty conscious of what was going on in the war. Do you remember what your brother flew in the Air Force, Canadian Air Force? He was not a pilot, he was a bombardier. Okay. So I'm not sure what he would have flown in. Okay. And then you went to enlist, and what happened? Well, I'd been turned down um, while I was at the university, actually, in the um, early part of the war, uh, 40 or somewhere in there, because I'd had, uh, I'd had rheumatic fever, and it was, they didn't like that background, although I had minimal, appeared to have minimal evident damage to my heart. 
So when I graduated in spring of 41, I had I was then heading down. I'd been accepted to Harvard Business School, Graduate School of Business, for the fall of 41. I had to get a, um, a U.S. Uh, student visa and uh, the consul in Regina at the time, and I had to get a medical. So I got a medical for the U.S. consul in Regina. And the doctor that gave me the medical, he said, you know, if you'd had a rheumatic fever, he said, I'd never know it. Uh -huh. He said, I can't, I, wouldn't, I, I would never seem suspected. In other words, he couldn't find anything uh, evident of my heart murmurs or whatever. So I said, well, is that right? So I, it was about June, I went across the street where the RCA Afghan Air Force Recruiting Headquarters was, and I went in there, and they accepted me. In about uh, June or so, July of 41. So then I spent several months doing the guard duty and all those kind of things that they do preliminary to a regular training. And then they, we started our regular training, they did another medical. And the other medical, they, uh, they say, discharge me. I've got a, a medical discharge certificate, it's a copy of it's here. And it says on that medical, uh, December 41, that I was physically unfit for any form of Air Force service. That's <laughs> December 41. Yeah. And um, so then I went on down to uh, to, the, to the winter semester, January semester at Harvard Business School. Of course, by that time, Pearl Harbor took place in December. And the U.S., of course, was in the war, and it was a pretty bad scene then. And Hitler had overrun Europe, and the Japs had knocked out the best part of the U.S. fleet in Pearl Harbor, and it was a pretty grim scene. What do you remember? Do you remember where you were the day Pearl Harbor was announced? I remember it very well. It was a Sunday. I'd been to uh, I'd been to Mass in the morning. I was still wearing my Canadian uniform and uh, went over to my mother and dad's for lunch, uh, brunch, and uh, the news came in around that time. I think it was uh, midday because Pearl Harbor time was, was around midday our time, and uh, it was pretty shocking news. And um, so when I went down, went on down to Boston in January, to, back to that higher business school, I um, I got thinking, uh, see I was just 21 at the time, and I knew this was sort of borderline medical situation of mine, at least I received that. So I went about seeing what I could do to get into the, I felt I had an obligation to, to serve. The world was really, in, it was a terrible world scene actually at the time, and um, it, it's too long a story to tell how I how I got in. But eventually, uh, they arranged a an eager Beaver recruiting officer in Boston. He arranged a special medical for me, and uh, and I passed the medical. And then they had to get some waivers to because uh, an alien couldn't enlist at that time. So I need decided to see at that time it was Army Air Force. It didn't have a separate Air Force in those days. So he said, well, he said, you're an alien, you could get drafted even though you're exempt from the draft because you're an alien. And that would get you into the Army and then we'd get you switched over to the Air Force and you could have one to be in the Air Force. And they carry on from there. And uh, so um, here's my son Paul. He wanted to be a spectator. I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> what I had to do was I had to get myself drafted. Of course, at that time, uh, the draft board out at Cambridge, Massachusetts was right after the war started and there were a lot of students at the university who were getting deferments until they finished the spring semester and so on. And here's this Canadian marches up, not subject to the draft, and, uh, and asked to be drafted, what they called a voluntary inductment. They wanted to send me to a psychiatrist, that there's something wrong with me. <laughs> So anyway, I got I got myself drafted. So that gets me into the into the um, uh, uh, through the army uh, into the uh, and then I got shunted off to the Air Force and then I went on and did my Air Force training. It was still uh, I was still supposed to get citizens. There was some quite a few complications I had that got resolved eventually by way of a special waiver granted by uh, General. Uh, what was his name? The head of the Air Force. Arnold. Arnold, yeah. 
he was the only one that had authority to grant all these waivers just just before I got my uh, wings and commission. <laughs> the records, they, they, they slipped up a little bit in the records and I didn't think it was my duty to correct them, so I went on th right on through uh, pilot training and uh, told the adjutant at Douglas, Arizona, I said one day, he said, that I was a couple of weeks from graduation, he said, Mr. Hill, there seems to be some irregularity about your records. And I said, oh, sir. <laughs> so I explained the whole thing. He put his head in his hand and said, oh my God. <laughs> he says, we got a quarter of a million dollars invested in you now. We better <laughs> get this fixed. See? So anyway, they they ran it through all the various chains of command and had to go right up to Washington. To, and they, 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 I wish I had that memo today. They, they, they fired it. Telex, I guess it was in those days, that came through from Washington, just came through the day before we were to get our wings in commission. My parents were already down there in uh, Douglas, Arizona, and, and uh, so they granted the, this is granting the special waivers and uh, signed by General Hap Arnold and uh, directed that the uh, Aviation Cadet Examining Board be convened forthwith that afternoon to. Uh, me as a cadet. I'd never even been through an aviation cadet examining board. But they had me down as a cadet all the way through. So they convened a board that afternoon. Uh, I was made a cadet, which, which I had already been acting as for all my year or so. And I graduated the next day. Do you remember anything as being a Canadian in the United States Air Force that where you were kitted or you had a nickname or? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so you, Got along very well. Did you oh, st yeah. start out as? Actually, as a matter of fact, I found, I found up my, uh, the, the United States. I found it, uh, although I, I, not just saying I was a loyal Canadian, but I found a, a great sense of um, national pride and patriotism amongst the Americans that I had never uh, uh, sensed uh, at home. Oh, of course, I was still fairly young, but. And I think in the war that sense of patriotism developed quite a bit when, as the war went on. But Canada, as a nation itself, was uh, more and more. It, was, it would have been a colony for a long while up until the, you know. Um, so there, there was there wasn't a, there, was, there was something subtle there about the great sense of uh, of national uh, legitimate national pride that uh, that the Americans had that I. Living with them, that I really felt, and, uh, and it's a very a fine quality, I think. Of, so I'm, uh, I'm very partial to be to, to Americans for, just for that alone. Were you married then? Uh, I got married just when I finished my training. I was stationed near Washington, and I met my wife. She was working in Washington, and my co pilot was from Washington. And, we, uh, we met in Washington. Um, she was from Winnipeg, Canada. We met after, and we were married after five dates. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, where was the first date? Well, I met her. She was, she was, I, I was supposed to go, and uh, my mother wanted me. There was a, a young lady who had been a. Um, my mother was her godmother, and her family were kind of split up. So she'd lived with us for a bit when she was in her teens, and she was working in Washington. And my mother said, "No, when you get into Washington, you got to look up Mary Jane." And uh, she was not, there was nothing wrong with Mary Jane, but my my buddy Dan Hurst and my co-pilot, uh, uh, you know, he said, "You know, there's lots of dates in Washington, <laughs> lots of spare young gals there, and." Uh, so we, we, we managed to, to maneuver a, a weekend off. We, just, we got there just before Christmas, and it was a big fault on us. We were down Langley Field, Virginia. So I said, well, Dan, look at that. I've got one obligation. I promised my mother I've got to see this Mary Jane. Well, uh, he said, well, then he said, Let's, you know, we, we can take her to lunch. Let's not kill an evening. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we take Mary Jane to lunch, and she's living in this apartment with four other uh, Canadian girls, they were working there for the British supply mission, and uh, they were having a party that night, pre-Christmas party, and uh, so anyway, I wind up at this. Uh, we weren't going to 
we didn't commit ourselves to going to the party when we were invited because we thought maybe we might find something better to do. But uh, we wind up over at this party and the lady, the young lady that answered the door was, was Shirley, my, who became my wife. And we were we were very taken with each other that evening and uh, that's really when it was solidified. I really love it for a sight. And where did you propose? Was it, you say, on the no, fifth no, date? About, uh, uh, yeah, I think about the third or fourth date. Because I was lying in space down Langley Field, so when he got in every three or four days, I got a chance to see her. And we were married first of February, so this was the 20th of December we met. And we were married first of February. And we have, uh, we have 54 years of uh, married life before she passed away. Uh, we were married on February 1st, 1944, in Washington, D.C. And, and what was her maiden name? Her maiden name was uh, Shirley Mulvihill. And uh, she, um, and we were married for 54 years before she passed away, six, seven years ago. Uh, lived and uh, uh, 14 grandchildren, 10 great-grandchildren. One still one coming up, but uh, in, uh, in about five weeks, I thought I was going to have a longer time. We don't have a longer time, so we only, we only had five weeks together before, uh, before I was um, given a liberator to fly over to Italy. And what was your routing? You, I think you mentioned that to me. Yeah, we went, um, we picked the plane up, and um, I got, in fact, got the orders here. We picked the plane up in um, Mitchell Field, New York. Was it one of the new liberators that were being made at that, that, that Willow Run plant that Ford built? And um, although my my foreign engine training had been in, in B-17 fortresses, but um, we had then I'd had some training in B-24. So anyway, we got this B-24, which I didn't like as well as a Ford. So uh, we got orders to take that down to Homestead, Florida, and all we knew that we were going overseas, but we didn't know where. In fact, when we had flew out of Florida, we were we weren't supposed to look at our orders for an hour after takeoff. But we went Florida to Puerto Rico, um, uh, Georgetown, British Guiana, an airfield hacked out of the jungle there, and across the Amazon, across the uh, to um, those uh, big forests in Brazil and uh, the equatorial forest to. An airport on the mouth of the Belém River, or the Belém was the title of the city, the mouth of the Amazon. And Sixty miles wide there, the mouth of the Amazon. Rain 300 inches a day there. And then we went from there to um, Recife on the bulge of Brazil, that's on that big bulge that bulges out eastward. And then we flew from there, that was the shortest road across the Atlantic, we went from, from there to Dakar in uh, West Africa. And Dakar across the Sahara to uh, um, Marrakech, Morocco, and in Marrakech to Tunis. They just cleaned the Germans out of North Africa right? just before that. And then uh, we landed an airstrip there in Tunis, and uh, we got instructions there how to where to go up in Italy. And uh, the um, the Germans still occupied uh, most of Italy. They still had Rome. I think they took over Naples somewhere around that time, but this was like in about March 44, pretty badly, and they needed B-17 pilots, so both my co-pilot and I had B-17 training, so we were assigned new crews B on B-7, H-U-R-S-O-N, and he was from Washington, he, he was the best man at my wedding. We became very close life, lifetime friends. And is he on your left or right? or He's right next to me on the... Right. On my right hand side, I guess. Okay, you're in the middle then there then. He just passed away about a year ago. He, uh, oh, I'll hold her down just a little no. bit more. Uh, yeah, Dad's here. Okay. Person's here. Uh, lower it just a touch. Okay. I don't want to get a real tight one of the two of them together. Uh, but when we got to Italy, uh, they had some bad losses uh, amongst the B-17 groups. And uh, so we were split up and uh, I went to take the place of a pilot that had been killed by a B-17 crew. Dan, he went to another crew, B-17s, and um, uh, my co-pilot was uh, 
lives down here. He's living down here in California. He's not very well. But, uh, and uh, we overnighted there, and that's where um, I guess it was that old fighter strip out, and they they just taken the back that territory. They, they, you know what that. I go downtown into the office. Uh, there's an office in the Tunis. We had to get our orders of where we went from there, because we had uh, gunners hadn't had gunnery training and whatnot. And I told the, the colonel, I said, I understand we're going to get some gunnery training. He says, yeah. And he says, you see that map up there? There are the front lines. You know, we're down south around Foggia and Naples. And he said, there's a couple of gravel patches with metal pads on them, call them runways. He said, you go up there, and he said, you'll get lots of gunnery training, the real stuff, real quick. <laughs> <laughs> So that was Liberators. When did you switch to the B-17? Well, as soon as we got there, uh, the, um, the, uh, the B-17 groups had, had, had taken a real beating on an on air battle uh, just as we got to Italy, and uh, they were desperate for B-17 pilots. And both Dan Hurst and I had taken B-17 training, our four-engine training, so that's where we got split up when I went on. I filled, I took a four from a crew that had lost their pilot and uh, had another crew. And uh, and Dan Hurston, my co-pilot, he got another crew of his own. So uh, from there on, I flew B-17s. The rest, uh, all the rest, all my, in fact, all my missions were done in B-17s. What was your first mission? I can't remember what the exact first, but uh, the, one of the early ones was to the pro oil fields, which was most, uh, one of the most heavily guarded targets in Europe. It was, there had been a pro raid out of North Africa at low level, and it was a Shimazo. It was B-24s. We went in high level, 30,000 feet or whatever. And, um, but boy, I can still see those fighters coming through us. They were hot shots. But uh, about a third, I think I mentioned in there, about a third of Hitler's oil supplies were coming from the pro oil fields. Was just right north of um, Bucharest in Romania. And so I think we messed things up there quite a bit. Well, you had 32 missions. Yeah. Were there any of them that were milk runs, or were there two or three that were especially challenging? Well, the real challenging one is that one that was being annoyed said where I had, from, uh, where I had um, it was a heavily defended target. They just that was out of range of England, and they just completed. Um, they built a new aircraft factory there to build fighters, and um, and it was a very heavily defended target. And uh, we uh, we took a real beating there. But, uh, anyway, in my case, that's where I got uh, we had got two engines shot out on one side, and one man killed, bombardier was killed, and um, we. Um, It was touch and go getting getting back to uh, the base in Italy, and then the one engine caught fire just as we landed because it was one engine was windmilling. The feathering mechanism, you know, the feathering mechanism was where you could on a dead end you could turn it so it was uh, at right angles to the uh, wind and uh, didn't didn't windmill. The, got one engine that uh, was we I was able to feather. The other one with the feathering mechanism was shot out, so it was it was windmilling. And so it was in windmilling all the way back to Italy, and of course there was no oil in there. And uh, building up heat, it caught fire just as we hit the runway. And I remember they had the fire trucks out and foam all over the place. And had one. So that mission was the, um, uh, that was really a miracle I ever got, ever got back. How did you get shot up? Was it ground fire or was it aerial combat? A combination. A lot of it was uh, was um, anti aircraft. They had Germans had that um, uh, 88 millimeter anti aircraft gun. That was a super weapon, and it was very effective at very high altitudes. And um, but then we had uh, we had fighters on on that. I don't know. With matter of fact, there was two fighters that were holding out because we had to drag back from the formation and um, with the damage done we couldn't hold altitude and I, I called the, the flight commander, the colonel, to see if he could slow the, uh, the group up a little bit so as I could uh, 
I could lose altitude but keep enough speed to keep under their protection. Well, these two fighters that were watching us uh, delay, because uh, they can only stick around so long, they had uh, two limited fuel fighters. So he did that actually, and my Dan Herson, like this guy, the one that my former co pilot was a close friend, he was flying his own crew that day. He said he, when he heard me call to the colonel, flight commander, he said he started composing the letter to Shirley. Mm. He never thought I'd get back. Jeez. And, uh, we got out, we, we dropped a lot of weight, we let, unscrewed the ball, the ball turret. Um, everything we could do to reduce, reduce weight because we had a, had some Alps to try to cross to get down to the Adriatic. But we got there, barely. How how many air miles was that? I don't know. Don't remember. Okay. I'm, the gear stay up when you landed, or did it collapse? Yeah, it did in that case. I had one mission out of England, I think, where the gears over here went down. We had. I had a lot of missions where a lot of battle damage, but um, I know there was one trip to Leipzig out of England, one trip to Leipzig where we took a lot of battle damage. We had one huge big hole through the the um, horizontal horizontal stabilizer in the tail section, and our, our, our um, I guess our brakes or landing gear we had flat tires. I forget what, but we just we sort of ground looped uh, after someone after we landed because we couldn't control. Uh, landing too well. One of the higher ranking officers came out and stood up through this hole in the horizontal tail section that was that <laughs> big and his picture taken. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> when you told what different was it? I had to fly the thing through that. <laughs> the, uh, they were all um, pretty stressful. Cologne Cologne was my last mission, that's where I was grounded, and um, what we called the flight surgeon, he uh, he kept track of us from a medical standpoint and uh, for the squadron, and uh, he knew me quite well, and, and I guess I, I was, in, uh, he, I guess he'd had his eye on me for, because uh, I was back on a second tour for the last seven missions, and, uh, uh, and he grounded me after I landed on that mission Cologne, it was pretty bad. Air battle there, and um, there was a dispute with a new hotshot squadron leader just come up in the states, and uh, so the flight surgeon sent me to the Eighth Air Force Medical Headquarters. They examined and they diagnosed me as uh, common severe combat fatigue. These days, I think they call it post-traumatic stress syndrome. I think. Same thing, but. So I was in pretty poor shape, that I, and I got signed back to the States and I went to Convalescent Hospital. I, I've got that at the tail end of my memory and I'm there. I was there for about four or five months in uh, Spokane and really, really well looked after. We had our own personal physician and a lot of recreational activities and uh, gas coupons and uh, workshops. Uh, did some wood woodworking and various things, and they, they did a great deal uh, before. We were, they just got those things going, and it, um, when I look back on that now, it was, um, uh, it was a major factor in me being ready to get back into um, civilian life again. And, um, as I went to the back to the Harvard Business School in January '46, they opened that just after the war. See the, the war didn't end until August 15th of 45, that was the Japanese end of it. You had a personal physician there assigned to you, I think yeah, you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was very good and uh, it, was a, it was an excellent program. Um, a lot of the guys uh, uh, you know, uh, were candidates for that, when some of them were just fortunate as I was to get assigned there because I guess I was at my tail end of my reservoir of <laughs> the ability to carry on. Do you remember any humor or fun or things during those years when you're flying? You know, a lot of the guys 
have stories, and I don't know if anything like that comes to mind. Well, I, the thing that I remember most was we didn't, um, uh, like when we were moved, uh, I was moved up to England, I uh, wasn't in Italy very long, I was moved up to England um, there in about, was it May, uh, May 44, and just not long before DD, and they had us flying, so, uh, and, um, the guys were just uh, flaking out from fatigue the ones that were living. And we didn't have, uh, we didn't get enough sleep. We were up early on mission and, uh, and uh, you know, briefing and um, it was all daylight bombing, you know, briefing and, and um, I remember we got to a point where, um, where my co-pilot and I, we were flying formation, which was hard work to start with at high altitude. And uh, I got to the point where I'd have, we'd, We'd fly for each one fly for 15 minutes. We have the clock up on the up above, and each 15 minutes we'd just turn it over to each other, and we'd each go to sleep, just like that. So tired we were. Yeah. Just drop off completely. Was so we didn't have. A, I, I barely remember. I think I got down to London once, but we didn't. Uh, we were just going. So see, I was right after D Day, and we were going like you wouldn't believe there for. Uh, on in through uh, June and July, and terrible weather. We flew when the birds weren't flying. And you didn't have any leaves during that time? You didn't come back to Canada? Or no, I came back. I, they gave us a, they dangled a, um, a leave deal that we could take five missions off. Like, we were supposed to do 30 missions. They raised it from 25, and then they said, well, they would, uh, we wanted to, um, we wanted to take a leave after the 25 missions and come back and do 15 more. That was a deal they offered us. So I thought, well, what the hell, I'm pardon the language, but uh, I'm still alive and uh, uh, maybe the world will be over by the time I get back, time my horse around with leaves and so on. So we had this 30 day leave, so I took that. I, wouldn't, I wasn't being braved by off volunteering for a second tour. It was a, just, <laughs> I was playing the odds, I guess. Yeah. So I had to leave at home during the summer, of, uh, midsummer um, of '44, uh, and I came back in the fall, and that's when I finished. I did these other seven missions, uh, and I was gone. But they canceled that program because they found that the guys that were taking it, they were already worn out. And, um, and so I think they were watching us. Take, well, they know they were watching us extra special. They, they, Late surgeons, uh, those that were on that program, and that's, that's true. We, we were pretty, pretty worn out by the time we got through. So you, the losses were huge. I saw the figures in the Pentagon um, later, and they they programmed for only one third completing a tour of duty. The losses were two thirds. That's pretty high. Yeah. And they were trying to get it to 50-50, but the daylight bombing you see was. Um, very problematical as how was on whether they could sustain it. The British gave up uh, daylight bombing early in the war because they just said that uh, the losses were unsustainable. And that's all of their bombing at all these it was at night. And which of course you don't have the same accuracy or anything and the uh, Americans were sure that they had with B seventeen and the twenty four where they had enough armament on that they could fight daylight and uh, have sustainable losses. Well initially they had they, they just their losses were unsustainable, so they cut back. And then they developed uh, fighter escorts, and they took some of the fighter planes, put extra fuel tanks on them, give them extra range. And once we got these, of course, to, to do the fighter escorts, they had to, to do them in tranches because uh, they're shorter range and different airspeed. So they could, uh, out of England, there, see our bombing missions, we'd have maybe as many as 1, 1,200 bombers in one. Uh, raid, but they'd have maybe six, seven hundred fighters would we'd f form up over England at the, at the altitudes we flew, uh, we flew formations, and uh, then they'd have say six or seven hundred fighters would take off later and uh, meet us at the coast and escort us to towards the target area, 
then they'd have to turn around and come back. But there would be another tranche of six or seven hundred that would go take off later still and, and meet us at the target area to, to escort us through the target area. And then they'd head back, those that were still flying. Then it would have been a third tranche that would be would have come out and meet us coming off the target area to escort us back to the to the coast. So in other words, they'd have three times as many planes. But that cut down the losses significantly. We didn't have any air escort out of Italy. But uh, once they got those es fighter escorts, I think the losses started to come off uh, significantly. But the losses still were uh, much higher, I think, than anybody ever anticipated they were going to be. Do you remember anything about the flying characteristics of the B-17, uh, certain things you did or didn't do, or how did you like it as an airplane? Oh, it was a super airplane. There was no comparison to that in the 24, in my view. I was very pleased to get to get back out of the 24. Uh, so yeah, I did the B-17, my initial uh, training, and then we got in, they were put in, we were put in a B-24 group for operational training with a crew, and uh, it didn't have, um, uh, it, 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 was, it was still in the process of design when the war came along, so they sort of froze the design, they had this Davis wing, which had some very peculiar characteristics to it. it it, uh, so it was basically underpowered for that type of wing. So we could, uh, I think, get uh, your your maximum altitude with a full bomb load, which uh, you know was was all well beyond the design uh, weight of the plane. I think they could be 24, 24,000 feet was the maximum altitude, whereas with the B-17 we get 30, 31,000 feet, which made a big difference in. Uh, from a loss standpoint, and the B-17 could take far more battle damage, and it had electrical control systems versus a B-24 hydraulics. So if you got your hydraulics, you got a hole anywhere in your hydraulics, and everything was out. Yeah. It was on hydraulics for the B-17s. <laughs> take far more uh, battle damage, and still survive. So I always felt that uh, that switch to B-17s when we got over to Italy was was a savior. Uh, it was a super plane. Uh, it would have been, you see, it was the earlier earlier design bomber, and it was uh, matured, shall we say, in terms of design. That's what they have over the museums, B-17G, I think. I think the last one I flew was an F, you know, if we were to the F. But um, there were uh, and a whole flight characteristics that were really well, uh, well balanced. Uh, They had, I think, higher production capability, uh, manufacturing capabilities. 24 to 4 built that big run plant. But still, I think the total production of uh, B 17 was about uh, 13,000. And B 24s, I think, maybe 16 or 18, something like that. 19,000 they said in that program. Yeah, they said in that program. I didn't think it'd be that high, but they, they produced more B 24s, but the uh, was still, you know, six, over 13,000 I want to take a look. Your last mission, where was that and how was it coming back? What are some of the things you ran into with the plane? This was my last mission. This was my worst mission. On your worst mission, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, the first thing was that uh, we had a couple of fighters up being up behind us. See, they used to stand by in a battle and look for planes that were wounded uh, or damaged and uh, they, after the rest of the group got going and uh, the, group, the group as a whole had a lot of firepower see? our, our bomb group had been in formation so they'd be always watching for the, the wounded ones and then they'd pick them off so there were two fighters up behind us uh, that were seen to be Taker. seen to be watching us and, uh, thank you that's when I called the group commander to see if he could slow the whole group up a little bit. So I'd be I'd drop down in altitude to keep up my airspeed with these two engines out on one side uh, for a little while uh, coming out of the target area. But I'd have the benefit of their firepower, our group's firepower. Those fighters came after us. So they'd have to come by the 
group's fighter power to get at us, even though we were lower out, at lower altitude, and which he did. And, uh, so just long enough that the, those two fighters finally buzzed off, and then we stood, we just went ahead and struggled our way back. We unloaded everything we could in the way of weight, and uh, had the one man dead, and uh, um, and on, uh, just the two engines going on the one side. And one that was feathered, and one on the other side, one that was feathered, and one that was windmilling. So it was touch and go. I don't think we, uh, can't recall that we seriously considered uh, bailing out. We had a fair amount of altitude to maintain to get across those Alps, south end of Austria to where, where we got to the Adriatic. I have another map today that Cindy sent, uh, the secretary sent, that takes that shows the uh, the, uh, from there down to my base in Italy, that cuts off there in uh, Croatia. There, I have another one coming down that shows it all the way down to where the base was in Italy. But you had a pretty rough landing too, didn't you? Uh, well, the landing itself uh, uh, was okay. We went, just as we landed, the, the uh, this windmilling engine caught fire because it had been building up heat, no oil in it. You see. And had been windmilling all that time mm -hmm. to, I don't know how long, maybe two, three, couple hours or so, up back, more. Those air speeds weren't all that high in those days, seems to me we only did about 200 miles an hour, something like that. You know what? <clears throat> today, you know, uh, we had, um, out of England, we had some other rough missions. Uh, the battle damage on one of the one at Leipzig was a lot of battle damage. There was one I think I had fifty-seven holes in the plane. <laughs> I remember one that came right uh, where the hole came right through the um, you know like the cockpit. Just went through me just behind me. Came in the side and out the back of the little cockpit. You know uh, extended area there, but. Um, You re received some well-deserved recognition and medals, and can you tell us what those were? Well, I received the um, the air medal, which um, and with uh, three oak leaf clusters, which means with three more air medals, that's like four air medals. And then I really got four of those air medals. And then, uh, this is the air, me medal. air medal, and then okay, I'm gonna. Means each set of a total of four. Oh, those are showing good. That's good. Okay. The DFC, of course, is the is the higher rated medal. But, uh, and I want to show that one big too. It's here and it's in there. Okay. Mission, you got the DFC on. I think I got it at the end of the tour. I don't think it was related to a specific mission. Okay. I can't find the citation. I tried to get it about several years ago, and I. My records, it was a big fire, a big record, a big fire in a record storage place in St. Louis that burned everything from the. You think that looked good? Yeah. It burned up everything that started with each. <laughs> oh. I'd like to, you know, they, they give the, I don't know what happened to the citation, but it, that was, uh, that was given at the um, completion of the, of the tour of duty. Your children and grandchildren and theirs will be viewing this. What would you like them to remember about World War II and our joint country's efforts? Well, I think um, from a historical standpoint, it was, the, it was a, the worst time conflicts in the history of mankind, and um, it was really it was really virtually worldwide with the, um, the two of these. Um, uh, evil tyrannies, uh, Hitler and Hitler in Germany, who uh, overran all of Europe and um, very nearly defeated the British and the British Isles, and then the, and then the Japanese come along, and uh, the United States at that time, although they had been building up their military, were woefully unprepared, as were most of the Western countries for, in terms of Hitler. And they come and uh, virtually knock out 
biggest part of the U.S. fleet that uh, won blow Pearl Harbor and uh, dominating the Pacific Ocean and, uh, and uh, California was wide open. There was no defenses. So you had a, a, a terrible scene worldwide here. You had these, these two tyrannies, Tojo, the militaristic government in Japan, who had been uh, building up their military since the middle 30s. They had been fighting in China. And so these two nations, Hitler and uh, the Japanese, had been building up a huge uh, war machine. And they were, um, they were run by very evil regimes. In the terms of uh, Hitler, with his uh, anti-Semitism, and um, they were just ruthless, um, and um, uh, and the Western democracies were ill-prepared, vastly ill-prepared for uh, these events in terms of their own military preparedness. I think the Roosevelt uh, performed a fantastic political job in trying to keep the United States, uh, um, uh, get, getting, ready, getting the United States ready to for conflict because you have a tremendous amount of opposition. I remember very well the, the, what they call the, you probably would remember the, um, um, what they call them, the isolationists. It was a senator. Um, Ohio, Taft, 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 and with Vandenberg, wasn't he another one? Common mm. leaders in the Senate, and uh, they said, we, you're going to let the Europeans fight their own wars, we're keeping out. And um, so there was a very strong political element in the United States that uh, wanted to, in a sense, bury their head in the sand. And I think one of the remarkable things is that the, the U.S. draft, Congress, in, I think in the fall of 1940, uh, by one vote, that's yeah. how close it was. And um, uh, and then Roosevelt did, did these other schemes to try and help Britain with it, lend lease and various uh, things to get around the law. You know, he, he, he played. It. Roosevelt was quite a politician, but he uh, he recognized the potential menace, and I think he deserved a tremendous amount of credit for. What he was able to do and against great odds politically to give you an idea of, uh, of uh, one thing that I always remember was that the day of Pearl Harbor, Senator Taft was speaking at a luncheon meeting in Chicago. And I was on that Sunday, and uh, so around that time of day was just about, uh, it was just not long after uh, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. By that time, there was the news that Chicago Tribune, I said, had a big extra, I think, in the, in the middle of uh, Taft's speech. They, they brought this paper up, and of course, it has about the, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And Taft's response was, that's just more Roosevelt propaganda. Huh. Talk about having your head buried in the sand, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the atmosphere. And um, uh, Conrad Black, in his latest biography of... Uh, Roosevelt um, deals with that quite well, but Roosevelt was walking on a creative age there politically. Fortunately, he got reelected. But it was because uh, uh, he he saw the potential menace, um, and um, was the United States right after Pearl Harbor immediately declared war on Germany, and uh, everybody got into the fray. But there were we were so far behind. It was three years before they were able to invade Europe. Well, they went into North Africa, I guess, in uh, 42. 42 yeah. But uh, um, the, main, the main invasion of D-Day was uh, 44, eh? So it was, um, anyway, you know, it was touch and go there, I'll tell you that. They were, they were formidable enemies. There wasn't any uh, pushover. Had uh, Germany predicted that the industrial uh, capacity behind their war effort was huge. You know, it was a pretty well developed industrial nation, but they'd been preparing, in spite of all the treaties and everything, they'd been preparing for 
for several years there after Hitler got elected. And you know, he did get in by elect, uh, Democrat election in 33. He didn't get a majority, but he didn't. He, he was being he made chancellor, and then he took over, and there were no more elections. But, um, but I, can remember, uh, I can remember the, um, the pacifist attitude that go to the famous time when Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, went over and met with Hitler in uh, Munich. And he comes back, I can still see that on the movie tone, they call them, you know, those uh, videos of movie, uh, news videos. And here's Chamberlain getting out of the plane there in England and, and declaring peace, in, uh, this is about 37 or 8, peace in our time. And he held out this letter. He says, I have her Hitler's word for it. So I fastened this letter that Hitler signed, her, her, her Hitler's word for it. The, as the British Prime Minister a year or two before, you know. I mean, that, but that was the frame of mind, you see. They weren't able, willing to face up to the facts of what was really happening. So by the time, uh, the time we got into the war and the U.S. got into the war, uh, those days, both the Japanese and the, the Germans were, you know, they built up a huge military uh, machine. I mean, they were, um, they were real formidable enemies. In our, um, what, what, one of the things we were doing, our daylight strategic bombing, one of our main thrusts uh, uh, during the time I was there was to do as much damage as we could to their oil, so, uh, aviation, their fuel, their fuel supplies. And that was the object of uh, the Poesti raids. But then when I got up to England, we were doing, uh, Hamburg was a major target where you had the synthetic fuel uh, industry. They were making uh, uh, fuel out of uh, coal, and we had Hamburg. I remember this one place. We had Hamburg in flames. You know, it was, uh, and we really did. Uh, uh, we really did mess up their fuel supplies. We had a British air marshal speak to us one day, and uh, said that we, that it, what we had done on the, on their fuel supplies was was strategically very significant, and we saw signs of it when after D-Day. There were fighter fields where the planes didn't come, come didn't get in the air because they were short of fuel, and I think it showed up also on the on the armies on the they were really um, strapped uh, for uh, fuel. Now that a lot of that stuff they could were able to repair, you know, eventually. But uh, uh, you know, I think uh, the, our daylight bombing campaign against fuel supplies had a significant played a significant role. Well, then came uh, the end of the war, and you went to Harvard. You said out yeah. of uh, were you discharged then? Uh, I was discharged in September '45, okay. from the officially from the uh, convalescent hospital, and then the Harvard opened in January '46, okay. and uh, I went. Uh, and then you purchased your business from your father. Yeah, in '53. I okay. went back to work for there, and then uh, he was getting way old. He was in his seventies, and uh, we made a deal. It was a modestly small, but it was a modest sized business. It wasn't very big at the time, but we gradually expanded over the years. This is the guy that runs it now. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you had a an anniversary in two thousand three. Yeah, hundred years. Hundred years. It actually just happened to me. That was 50 years after I bought. I bought from my father. It started in 19, 1903, and I bought the business in 1953. And then the 100th anniversary was in uh, 2003. So I owned it for that half half the time, 50 years. And it's, uh, of course, the business has been expanded into a lot of areas where we're sort of a mini conglomerate, I guess, eh, Paul? Sir, on behalf of the Palm Springs Air Museum, we want to thank you for your service to America and your own country. We're extremely proud of you as a veteran and what you've done. And it will always be recorded in our libraries. Thank you. Thank you. The Canadian Air Force did a certificate in 40, December 41 that I was physically unfit for any form of Air Force service. I did three years in the U.S. 
That, I'm 85. I'm that's still. great. I think if you just get a one day and put your armor on your dad, you'll be nice and tight in there. I can move okay. the camera back a little bit. And we got the flag behind you. Oh, that's terrific. Okay. Now, gentlemen, uh, would you talk a little bit about your business and what happened when your dad came out of the service and serving our country and yours? And uh, how did you get to the desert through kind of a broad stripe of all of that? Well, I can, when I graduated at Harvard in uh, 47, I was, my father was crowding 70 years of age then, and uh, I felt uh, I should go, and he was very anxious for me to come back. And uh, even though we had a socialist provincial government, I went there in spite of them. And um, so gradually, we uh, the uh, business of uh, we were able to build it up and expand it, and, um, yeah, and we were in a number of different areas. Uh, uh, we have um, insurance, we have a specialty of uh, the, the surety business, which uh, we operate called, under a company called Western Surety Company, uh, nationwide in Canada, and a lot of real estate, office building, and developing, and we develop a lot of residential residential probably 13, 1500 acres of residential property in Regina over the years. And we, we gradually expanded into Alberta and we and, and also down to the states. We have, uh, we have run, we've been uh, operations out of the states in, in uh, you know, out of the Phoenix office, how we going back to, uh, uh, back into the, what, the 70s? Uh, About 27 or 28 years now. Yeah. We have pretty substantial operations in, uh, in, the, in the real estate area. And, and you're the seventh, seventh largest one in, uh, in your specialties in Canada. Yeah, and the Western surety company Western in the, in the surety okay. business, yeah. And Paul Hill is the president and CEO. Yeah, he's the, he's the head on show. Yeah, I might just add, uh, in the, the war connection was uh, when uh, Dad went uh, back to Harvard. Uh, in 45, that's where I was born, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Well, that's right. And then <clears throat> my godfather was uh, Dan Herson, who was uh, the co-pilot uh, in, uh, yeah. in the B-17, uh, uh, yeah. flying the B-17s. And he was from Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, went to Georgetown. And uh, I ended up going to Georgetown in my undergraduate degree, and uh, then an MBA program and then the investment banking community before uh, Dad asked me to come back to Regina in 1976 and that's when we started uh, working together um, and then it was uh, during that after that time that we ended up uh, not by strategic planning I would say but by opportunistic uh, taking advantage of opportunities got involved in the broadcasting industry and the oil and gas industry and and the manufacturing uh, industry and a number of other businesses uh, over the subsequent years. Uh, yeah, we had the we leading TV station in Regina for several years. Oh, we have, yeah. We've got three radio stations, right? And we have three radio stations and we've just uh, been applying for additional licenses in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Edmonton, Fort McMurray and other uh, Western Canadian communities in that, in that industry. But I would say that we're not really a conglomerate, we're a series of small businesses that, we, that we've uh, been able to um, uh, get involved in successfully over the last uh, 25 or 30 years and, um, and grow those, those individual businesses uh, in Western Canada and in the real estate area in the United States. And how did you get to the desert? By plane. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I think we came, uh, my wife and I, um, I think we used to go to Hawaii quite a bit, and then we came down here in um, about 76 or 77, somewhere in there. And we spent one uh, winter over at another place, and then we decided we. Uh, like to maybe buy a place here, and so we bought this place in uh, I think '78. But we tended to take a fairly long winter 
stretch down here. You know, we're, our winters are pretty bad, mm. depending on your viewpoint about weather. But so. Um, well, I can tell you how I got here. Um, when uh, uh, my father and mother were looking for a, a place, um, there was uh, a couple of different places they were looking at, and uh, <clears throat> and my father went went in to negotiate the purchase of one of those places and uh, actually negotiated and made the deal and my mother was sitting out in the car and then uh, uh, he came out to the car and she said, no, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted, I wanted another one. Well, he'd already <laughs> bought that one. So he ended up going and buying the other one, uh, which left one uh, surplus uh, spare. Uh, spare unit. And uh, I think that must have been before Christmas, and, and we had young children at the time, so we came down and stayed in the, in the spare unit uh, oh, for uh, that Christmas. That was our first venture here, and then uh, subsequent years we, we came and visited, uh, stayed at different places, and then eventually bought our own. Uh, uh, we had uh, four kids at the time, and then, and then a fifth, so we had a, a bit of a... a we had a challenge transporting and and housing uh, all of those uh, all of those children, but we did that uh, subsequent to that, and that's how we got here. I guess it was '79 at that point, 1979. Well, you've been great supporters of the Palm Springs Air Museum and greatly appreciated. I think you were involved in it almost from the beginning when we opened up. Right. Yeah. yeah. We, well, it's a great uh, addition, uh, not only to the local area, but really to the country and. Um, I admire uh, Bob and Josie Pond to really have uh, you know put that whole concept together, and it's one of the well. There's several aircraft there that are, are very uh, one of the very few that even exist to exist, yeah. and the programs uh, for and they're flyable. And they're flyable, yeah, and the programs uh, that they have uh, that extend out to the community and particularly the school children. Uh, who uh, have been able to use this as an opportunity to gain uh, knowledge of, of that history mm -hmm. is outstanding. And fortunately, our children and grandchildren now will be able to access uh, this uh, history as well. Well, we mentioned earlier what we <clears throat> would like our grandchildren to remember what World War II meant. And would you like to wind up the interview with some comments on that, what it means to the countries? and to them individually? Paul, you really stated it pretty well. Okay. Well, I would say, uh, from my point of view, um, uh, Hitler and uh, Japan uh, were both uh, uh, headed towards world domination and uh, the elimination of freedom, democracy. And uh, if uh, Hitler had been successful, there's no doubt that today we would be living in an environment of tyranny in which we would not be able to enjoy the freedoms that we currently enjoy. And I think as uh, children and grandchildren, uh, we have to, uh, we do have a great appreciation for those that uh, preserved the freedoms that uh, we currently now uh, enjoy and live with. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I think the, the book, The Greatest Generation, uh, that was written is uh, is uh, Tom Brokaw's uh, contribution to that history, but all of us owe a great deal of of gratitude toward those people that preserved that freedom for us. I think I'm sorry. Did you want to add anything to? I think that um, probably not may not be realized that that, that Canada proportionately. Uh, proportion of population, and having started gone into war in '39, proportionately um, uh, made a uh, proportionately bigger contribution in terms of manpower and casualties and so on than probably anyone ever any other nation. Um, they uh, um, really went to uh, went all out. Well, we're grateful for the support of Canada even to this very day. Uh, so all the countries in the world, you've supported America better than anyone. Like going in with our hostages in Iran and, and when the flag was being criticized uh, oh, yeah. all over Canada, they were with support. And 
Sir, I thank you very much, and I'm very proud to have Can documented I some of this. One, one point. This week, uh, Canada has taken over uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, obligations in Afghanistan. So uh, it's not widely reported in the United States. So we're in they, command. The there's Canadian there's forces now are in command of Afghanistan, and they've just taken over that responsibility from the U.S. forces this I, week. I did not. Uh, I did not heard that. There are other units in there from Hall and so on, all part of, part of NATO. It's operated under NATO. Well, thank you very much. Can you think of anything you'd like to add to this? Oh, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time and energy output to work on this, and uh, I think apart from me, I mean, you've done uh, many others, I'm gathering, and that's a good contribution to the museum. It's an honor, sir. Yeah, I'd like to make one comment. Um, I appreciate uh, the continued um, leadership that the United States provides in the world toward preserving uh, freedom and democracy, and um, it's a great obligation. Uh, that the U.S. assumes at a great, uh, obviously, cost to the United States and Canada. I'm proud to be uh, part of both countries, and I'm proud to uh, be part of preserving uh, freedom and democracy around the world, which um, continues to take place, and I'm proud to have that association both as a Canadian and an American. Thank well, you. Concur in that superpower. But it's, a very, I think, in my view, a very responsible superpower, and thank God they're there uh, to help to protect us all. They're not perfect anymore than any other nation, too, but they're a great nation, and they have uh, great values, and, um, and uh, their uh, willingness to take the lead against this whole anti-terrorism battle we're in now and so mm -hmm. forth. It's, uh, we're fortunate to have the United States 